Uh, microphone, please. Okay. Yeah, that's working. Okay, so, uh, students, let's begin lecture. Uh, before we get started with anything else, let me just point out, this is lecture number 14, and so this is the halfway point of the semester. And what we do today is the last bit of information about the solar system that is not aimed out at the stars. Okay, we're just focusing on a solar system. Exam two will be about that. We'll talk about exam two in a second. But when we come back uh, from next week, uh, next Thursday, we'll start talking about asteroids, comets, and meteorites. And the way that we're going to talk about them uh, will actually uh, direct our interest uh, at the stars uh, because uh, the comets, asteroids, and meteorites, many of them are leftovers from the very formation of our solar system. And for that reason, uh, when we look at other solar systems like in the Orion Nebula that are forming, uh, we can uh, compare that to what we know from uh, comets, asteroids, and uh, meteorites. Okay, exam two comments. Uh, the procedures are the same. So Scantron pencil, eraser, calculator, and eye clicker two. And make sure that you have uh, good batteries in your eye clicker. We had a student that flaked out with their eye clicker batteries here a while back in the middle of class. Now, if that happens to you in the middle of an exam, you're gonna be uh, SOL. So uh, just make, so put some Duracell, especially if you bought it used, get some Duracells or some Energizers because the ones that they come with are the ultra cheapest batteries that they can buy and still get away with calling it a battery. So it's even cheaper than came apart you know, buying something that came apart, so. Uh, so just a word to the wise, be prepared for that. Okay, we'll have forward seating up to the front of the class like last time, and we'll try to put some yellow crime scene tape to wall off the last row as, as before. Uh, so if you can remember where you sat last time, that should work this time, okay? Uh, if you wanna sit somewhere else, that's perfectly fine. Uh, you may not use your cell phone for any reason, right? And we'll have a, I don't think we'll have a huge amount of calculations, but we may have one or two on the iClicker page uh, and maybe some cinchy ones that you can do longhand uh, or with a calculator on the multiple choice part of the test. By the way, they, if, if you, I know a bunch of these came without a Scantron last time. And so what you want to do is uh, either go to the SGA office, second floor of the student union, and get yourself one for free, or, you know, buy a package of them in one of the vending machines. Uh, and this one is actually down in the first floor of classroom building two, but they're around campus and stuff. Okay, now I want to talk about this topic. Um, students have been asking me... Uh, about, well, Dr. B, what's the list of chapters that we've covered? And uh, I've been thinking about all that. And uh, what we're going to do, uh, kind of organize your mind. Uh, we're going to develop that, but we're going to use discussions to do that. So pay careful attention. Um, we're going to uh, first do an eye clicker question. So have your eye clicker on. Um, and we're, I'm going to be asking you um, a little eye clicker survey about the chapters. Now, this is going to be a short answer, okay? Uh, in other words, what chapters do you, you know, recall us covering uh, in between 
you know, exam one and today. All right. So, and just answer to the best of your ability. Everybody will get full points for this. And this one is um, uh, a short answer. So type in a set of symbols, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Don't type in numbers, though. Type in symbols. Type in letters. Just go ahead with that. Well, I see somebody typed in chapter one. Yeah. But t type in as many, and if you can, you know, just type in what you can remember. And if you can't remember anything, just type in and. Now remember, this is, what I really want is since exam one, but I think some of you are putting in chapter one and stuff, which is all right. We can kind of figure it out from here. No, don't put in numbers. Four and five, no. I want A's, B's, and on up. Okay. All right, 30 seconds. And this will actually be part of our study activity. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, um, go ahead and show this. Now we get we're all over the board here. Uh, I get a whole slew of different, you know, this is incredible. All these different answers, people, just one person voted for them. DEF, what is DEF? Four, five, and six. Three people voted for that. See, see, see if we can find something that's popular. Popular response here. One percent, one percent, one percent. G H I K. There's four people. G I J K L. That's seven, nine, ten, and eleven. G K. Seven and eleven. Ooh. That's good. That's good. Anyways, what we'll, what I'll, what we'll do? This is just kind of a mental IQ test. Uh, we're going to sort out a final version of the chapters uh, in discussions, and, and let's take a look at that. Uh, I've set up a discussions thread. It's called Chapter Outline for Exam 2, How Do You Make It Out? And I want you to go in there, and if you have a good, if you've already worked out, you know, the chapters that you think are, are in Exam 2, but not Exam 1, okay, so... Let's so don't put chapter one in there because, I mean, that's always assumed. Uh, but uh, since exam one and up to including today, I want you to post in there. So just type in a list of the chapters and the subsections of the chapter. So we'll, we'll try to work out a list. And um, I want to show you something. I want to focus in a little bit closer. If you look at this. It says this is a graded discussion, All right? So that means that if you give me a good contribution, uh, Jenny and I will give you a one point bonus point, All right? So this baby right here, uh, uh, so this is to you know, help motivate you to actually contribute to this process and actually, I think it might be helpful because with a lot of people discussing it and kind of sorting it through and editing it and, you know, and maybe Jenny, maybe I'll just tell Jenny to make the final list on Monday night or Monday morning or something like that. Uh, that'll be a good study tool. And just the discussion thread itself will be a good study tool and a good study uh, process because it'll help you sharpen up your own thinking 
and so what you want to do is type, don't just type in chapter 7. Type in chapter 7.2 or, you know, whatever the subsection is. And we'll just try to add value to it as we go. And I'll be adding comments too. And so will Jenny. And so um, that's going to, and, and I want you to make comments too. If you, if you disagree with somebody else's list, tell them why. Or if, if, if there's something about their list that they should add to, you add it in a reply. All right, so I want you to go for it. Okay, like these guys. And, uh, you know, we'll get that study list going. All right, and that'll be even better than anything that I could give you. All right, questions about that? Okay, and uh, just to reinforce one bonus point, but only for really good contributions. You know, if you just say, oh, nice, or something like that, I'm not going to give you a bonus point for that. But if you type in something, and Jenny and I will be the judge of it, uh, you, you might get a bonus point. And hopefully I'll give a lot of people bonus points. Okay, multiple choice question ahead. Hit your refresh key. Um, let's talk about the moons. And uh, one of the things that we talked about when we talked about the moons in general and the planets, uh, here's a multiple choice question for you. Um, what's the pattern? Read carefully and vote. Let's see where you guys are at. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, good. Uh, most of you got that one correct. Spin state. And I want to reinforce that with you. So let's take a look at this next diagram. Um, so this, go ahead and make a sketch. Um, this shows um, Jupiter, you know, we're looking down at Jupiter from the vantage point of the North Star. Uh, and it orbits in a counterclockwise manner. So this circular arc that you see in the middle of the page, middle of the slide, uh, that re represents the orbit. The black arrow represents its velocity at this instant of time. And here's the sense of the orbit. So it's counterclockwise. And the sun's way off to the left somewhere. And I've got a dotted line from Jupiter toward the sun that represents the radius, big circle. And nothing's especially to scale on this, but it, you know, because we're just trying to think about the the um, spins and the orbits and stuff. The spin is also in the same sense. So give it a little bit of a spin, uh, a curved spin vector. And then the, the, the interesting thing is that um, the planets all have about the same uh, orbital sense. And most of the bigger and medium-sized moons do as well. So go ahead and type in a moon or sketch in a circular orbit for a moon. And it's got a velocity vector here. So there's the right here is the velocity around this instant of time, a little snapshot. And its spin is also uh, counterclockwise. So put a little spin for the for the moon. Now, the smaller moons are not like this. So the pattern is medium and larger, most of them. 
um, have the same, what we call angular momentum state. Uh, and we think that it's because of the formation of the solar system. Let's take another look at this. So most of the medium and large moons and angular momentum is the vocabulary term. And it's, you know, we're not going to do a whole lot of calculation with it, but it's something that astronomers, you know, can calculate whenever they need to. It's a physical quantity, uh, you know, like an acceleration or a speed or a distance. Uh, but it, it's, the, it's the, the momentum that an object has because it's either spinning or moving around a center of mass or moving around any, any spot in the universe. So, uh, and it's, it's actually an important factor in orbits, but it's something that gravitational forces uh, from the sun do not change, okay? So the force of gravity is always straight toward the sun, all right, straight towards the center of the sun. So for that reason, you don't get any force um, forward on the orbit, you know, counterclockwise at any time. You don't get anything slowing it down on its orbit. That would be clockwise. You just get straight in. So the only thing you get is something that doesn't change uh, the orbital angular momentum. Okay, so we say that it's a conserved quantity. And we believe that because of that, um, the angular, we believe that this tells us uh, something about the angular momentum state of the big swirly nebula that formed the sun, you know, four and a half billion years ago. Like the solar, like the nebula that we have seen in the Orion uh, constellation, the Orion Nebula. There's a lot of baby stars in there forming, we think. Uh, all kinds of nebulas that you see, you know, pictures with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, you know, and we can see these swirling, swirling blurbs of gas and dust that are eventually, or have already formed a new star. So now the exception to this angular momentum uh, state is uh, Uranus and a few of the other moons, all the, not all the moons follow this pattern, but most of them do. So the exception is Uranus. Uranus, the rotational axis of, Ur of, of Uranus is tipped on its side pretty much. It's like 97 degrees, I think, tipped over. So for instance, if you were looking down at the Earth instead of uh, Jupiter here, all right, uh, from the direction of the North Star, and you took the right, the fingers of your right hand and curved the fingers of your right hand in the sense of the orbit or in the sense of the spin, <coughs> they're both the same, then your thumb would be pointing at the North Star, All right? Let me repeat that. This is called the, the right hand rule, okay? And it's, for those of you that have had a physics class or a trig, well, physics class or engineering class, which I know some of you have, you've battled with the right hand rule. And it's basically this, for angular momentum, if you take the right hand, this right hand, not the other right hand, right? It's, take the, the real, the regular right hand, and you bend the fingers in the sense of the spin, or the sense of the orbit, then the thumb, if it's a planet, it'll, it'll be pointing, your thumb will be pointing basically in the direction of the North Star. Now there's a little bit of tiltiness, you know, so Jupiter, Saturn, and Earth. Earth is tilted, it's got an orbital plane like this, but its spin axis is not quite perpendicular to that orbital plane. And that's why we have seasons, you know, that. It's about 23 degrees, and so we have, you know, tilted toward the sun in the summer, tilted away from the sun six months away. That's our winter, which, which is what we have right now. Shorter days, longer nights. Uh, and so, so, you know, but our, you know, if you think of the North Star as the direction our spin axis is pointing at, then all the other planets, except for Uranus, are basically pointing, you know, pretty much the same direction. 
You know, so if you if you if you take a wide angle view, you'll you'll definitely see the North Star, right? Except for Uranus. Uranus, the spin the, the spin of Uranus is like this. I mean, if the if the orbital plane of the solar system is like this, and most of the planets are on it, including Uranus, Uranus is rotating pretty much in that orbital plane, okay? But it's not spinning that way. It's spinning like this. You know, so, the, so, so half the year, or for uh, a part of the year, the spin axis of Uranus is pointing at the sun. And the other half of the year, the other side of it's, well, not the Uranus year, you know, the other half of its orbit, it's pointing directly away from the sun. And part of the year, it's pointing kind of sideways to the sun. It's not even right angles to the sun, All right? So Uranus is the exception. And then a bunch of the smaller moons, because those are captured comets and asteroids, we think. So then they, they can come in from all directions. All right. Now, another thing that I want to mention to you, you can add to the notes, it's not on the slide. Um, you know, Uranus, it's definitely tilted out of the basic sense of every, all the other planets uh, for spin, but not for its orbit. Its orbit's pretty much in the plane of the, of the solar system. Um, and I mentioned that gravity, f formally speaking, the gravitational attraction of the SUN cannot change the orbital angular momentum state or the spin angular momentum <coughs> state. But what can change it is a collision. And you may say to yourself, Dr. B, what are planets in collision? Well, I mentioned before that the theory of the formation of the moon, uh, one of the uh, best theories, you know, we don't know for sure, but we're pretty sure it's something like this. Uh, the planet Thea, about the size of Mars, had an oblique collision with Earth, um, blazed up the surface of the Earth, and demolished itself, and a lot of the smithereens uh, went, you know, you know, flying around the solar system, but a, a good bunch of them formed into a ring around the Earth, and then eventually a lot of that formed um, the moon. And so uh, that's the, the, thea, the, the theory of Thea. So that would be something that could change the angular momentum state, a collision of that kind. Uh, but even that's kind of, you know, you, because the moon and, the, the moon and uh, Earth are pretty close to the right orbital plane and the right spin sense, so it's, now, let's take a look at this picture. This is a picture of Io, one of the moons of Jupiter. Oh, my goodness. There are volcanoes. Did I say that they have volcanoes on Mars? Yes. But the, and this is smaller than Mars. Io is a fairly small uh, moon, but um, my goodness, it has definitely got volcanoes. You can see it over here on the left edge. That plume... It's kind of bluish in color in this image. Uh, that basically is a volcanic plume. You know, like when Mount Vesuvius erupts or Mount Pinatubo down in the Philippines or, uh, you know, any of these, you know, you know the, the Yellowstone super volcano, when it blows, a lot of stuff, Mount St. Helens, that a lot of stuff goes up into the atmosphere. And that's what we're looking at in this picture. So. This plume over here, uh, the, the difference is that on Earth, we would never see a plume this ginormous. This is 86 miles of altitude, right? Even proportionally speaking, we never see anything of that size. You know, for, for, a, uh, for a plume from a volcano, you're maybe talking... 10, 15 miles. The really big, really big thunderheads, you know, thunderclouds get up 10, 15 miles, maybe. You know, uh, but there's nothing like this. All right, so, so there's a plume. Um, look at this image. Look at it carefully. You guys see another plume on there? Use your eyes. Your fantastic brain. 
What do you see? You see it? Where? You don't see it? What do you see? A black smudge? Come up here and point it out. You're on the aisle seat. Come on up here. Step forward, earthling. That's really high up. Uh, well, you could point. I have short arms. Up there. You mean th this thing right here? Yeah. Right there? Yeah. Ding. All right, yeah, that's a plume. And what is this black, the black smudge that you were talking about? That's the shadow of it. Now, the, the interesting thing is, the reason these plumes get so large is basically that the force of gravity at the surface of um, Io is really weak, right? And um, it's... It's weaker than, it's, it's a little bit stronger than the moon, but way weaker than Earth, all right? And, uh, and so we get, uh, the other thing that we get is tidal heating, like we talked about for Enceladus. We'll talk some more about that in a minute. Um, but what kind of a volcano is it? Well, it's not a water geyser like we were looking at for Enceladus. This one is regular lava, you think. And here's a close-up of the surface uh, and I believe this was taken with the, um, the Galileo spacecraft a while back. Um, and this one, it, they've, they've measured, see this burning hot lava over here? Go ahead and make a note, uh, 1,287 Kelvin. Yeah, that is extremely HOT. Boiling water is 373 Kelvin. So this is way, way, way up there temperature wise all right it's very very hot just like the lava on earth and they've actually measured the spectral signature the fingerprints uh, of this this and other uh, pieces of rock on the surface and so they they figured out you know it's it's uh it's a lot of uh, it's a lot like basalt you know the basaltic uh, lava here on earth and there's a lot of sulfur dioxide so here are the specs on the gravity. The strength of gravity, this is the acceleration due to gravity. This is a free fall acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. So that means when you're jumping out of an airplane, every second of free fall, except for air resistance, you get another 9.8 meters per second of speed for every second of free fall. Now the moon is about 1.6, and that's why those, those films of the Apollo astronauts on the moon um, you know, they could really jump and leap and stuff because of this, 1.6 meters per second squared. And Io is about 1.8. So anything that gets blazed out of a volcano in Io, the gravity's weaker, so it's going to arc a lot higher. And it's going to go way, way higher, 86 miles. We can't get that. You know, the biggest hydrogen bomb, forget about it. We don't even get anything close to that. You know, that they, you know, back in the 50s, the, the, or I guess maybe the 60s, the Soviets, uh, the Ruskies exploded the biggest H-bomb ever exploded on the surface of the Earth. Uh, man, it was big, but, you know, it's not going to get 86 miles or even uh, a tenth of that up into the atmosphere. Anyways, you can jot down this web address and uh, go look at this picture and a bunch of others. And as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of sulfur dioxide. The, the basalt is, is the lava's like Hawaii's basalt, you know, the black, you know, Hawaii. So it's, a, it's a lava flow in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, those black sand beaches that they have in Hawaii. Okay, so versus granite, you know, granite is a lighter color, uh, usually. Uh, sometimes it's kind of a rose colored granite, kind of a pinkish granite. But, the salt is usually pretty dark gray or dark, you know, black or dark brown. And here's a sulfur dioxide. There's a lot of sulfur dioxide in those plumes as well. And you know, here on Earth, our volcanoes put a lot of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. I mean, everybody's worried about global warming and stuff. So, you know, we want to cut down our man-made pollution, but there's no way to cut down our volcanoes. They just do whatever they want. 
And they put a huge, you know, in one day a volcano can put out like about 20 times the amount of CO, depending on the volcano, 20 times the amount of CO2 and carbon dioxide and water, you know, that we produce, you know, in man-made pollution and stuff. So uh, we still want to, you know, make sure we don't pollute and stuff. But, but anyways, lots of sulfur. And basically that's one of the reasons why back here this looks kind of yellowish. Uh, if you look at a color image of it, yeah, sulfur, a lot of sulfur. Just the way it, it worked out for the formation uh, of IO. Now, uh, clicker question, multiple choice. Um, if you've done some reading, you'll know the answer to this. If you haven't, you can make an educated guess. Why do the smaller moons without the regular shape, spherical shape, uh, ha why don't they have volcanic activity? This is interesting. We're going to show the students this. Display here. Okay, 20 seconds. I'm getting a headache. I better have a Ricola. That'll help. It won't help with headache, but it'll help with crankiness. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one, bing. Okay, display the answers, please. All right, now, a lot of you, you know, and I don't blame you, a lot of you um, voted for D. And the correct answer is, I shouldn't be doing this with cola. Okay, and can you switch back to regular display, please? Regular power, warp drive. Okay, so the answer is here, and you know, D is, I guess, I never thought of it before, but D is attractive, and it's true. I mean, you know, the smaller moons are one solid, supposed to be a piece of rock, not a piece of rock. Uh, Uh, no magma or mantle, that is that is correct, but the, the, the best answer is that for, for the moons that we see that are producing geysers and volcanoes and stuff, there's a lot of tidal heating. You know, basically the, the differential squeezing and pulling that happens when you're close to a large object like Jupiter or Saturn or, or the Earth. So uh, let's do a reinforcement of the tidal deformation. Now clear a couple, clear a page or so. We're going to be make, or you're going to be in a position now to make some sketches about tidal deformation and heating. So here's a picture of Io, and you can see one of the plumes up there near the top of it on the daylight side of Io, um, and this heating that's produced by tidal deformation. Uh, is, is what we're going to talk about. So Jupiter's actually way off to the right. So let me park that over to the right. Just get it out of the way. You know, so somewhere to the, to the right in this sketch is a big old Jupiter. Now Io, if you look at a kilogram of rock over here on the far side, opposite Jupiter, and then a kilogram of rock over here on the near side, under, or what would we call sub-Jovian underneath J Jupiter. Um, the near side is closer and the gravitational force is therefore stronger. So kilogram for kilogram, you're going to get a bigger acceleration on the near side. Right? So uh, that net force basically pulls um, Io apart like spaghetti, it squeezes it, I mean, when you do all the forces, you get a net squeeze down and an, and an elongation. So it, 
it tends to, now it doesn't turn Io into spaghetti. You know, a black hole would do that, uh, but Jupiter does tend to elongate it towards Jupiter and squeeze it, um, you know, transverse to Jupiter. So uh, we would, we, you know, astronomers and astrophysicists always use the word spaghetti for describing that tidal force. And that squeezing, as I mentioned last time, it's just like rubbing your hands together. You get a lot of frictional rubbing and stuff. And if something's rocky and it starts rubbing together, you're going to get a lot of friction. And that's going to heat things up. And then eventually it's going to blow. By the way, there's a plume up there on uh, Io. I think that they've been observing. Every time they observe it, it's blowing. They've got a plume going up there. So it's... So, they're thinking that it, that, you know, they should have caught it at a time when it's not erupting, but so far they've never observed this one, I think it's just one up on, on the north side of the picture here. Uh, they've never observed it when it wasn't erupting. And so they're thinking 18 years of eruption? Oh my goodness. You know, Mount St. Helens basically did all its damage in a week or so. You know, out there in the Pacific North, before you guys are even a, a gl most of you, a gleam in your parents' eye, Mount St. Helens blew, Mount Pinatubo, all the destructive volcanoes, a bunch of big ones up in Alaska, just nobody lives there. But, uh, you know, maybe a day, you know, maybe an eruption. And you get, you know, like California, they think they can predict earthquakes that are going to happen because earthquakes are similar to what sets off a volcano, just a little different shape and size of the Earth's crust. But, you know, they think, you know, they, they can measure small quakes in California and Mexico and then predict when the big one is going to happen. And, uh, you know, so one of these days, California is going to crack along the San Andreas Fault and fall off, well, probably won't fall off into the sea, but... Uh, although some people wish that it would, uh, but it's good. there's going to be a big one out there, and it's going to be horrendous. It won't be like Yellowstone blazing. And if Yellowstone goes, everybody goes, and the USA is going to be kaput. If if California goes, the big one over there, California is going to be. The coast of California is going to be ripped apart. It, it, it's not going to be, you know, all, a lot of people are going to die. It's going to, so, it, so all the, all the disasters, you know, that we, you know, like with Hurricane Harvey, everybody goes to Houston, tries to get things ship shape. You know, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane X, Y, Z, it's going to be, you know, Hurricane Harvey, Katrina, multiplied by about a million when the big one goes in Los Angeles, just simply because they have a lot of people and buildings that are going to fall apart. Question over here. Yeah, but one of them is bigger, okay? And so when you, when you do all the calculus, uh, the net effect the net force is going to be a lot of this and, and some squeeze down top, you know, north to south squeeze down, uh, east to west, pull, pull apart. Uh, so you could, you know, because it's rigid, so, well, it's pretty rigid. It's, it's not perfectly rigid. You know, we can measure this on Earth as well. You know, most planets will experience a little bit of this. Oh, and by the way, students, a tidal force... We can measure the tidal forces on the space shuttle when it's 200 miles up and above the surface of the Earth. Now, they're not that big, but depending on the orientation of the space shuttle, so the space, and a lot of times it orbits upside down with the cargo bay open towards the Earth, okay? And so the, the nose and the, and the tail of the space shuttle are sideways, and then the Earth's curving, you know, beneath it like that. We can measure that 
tidal deformation. It doesn't hurt the space shuttle. Because the bigger the object, the more um, difference in the tidal, in the gravitational forces from point A to point B. So nose, to, nose and tail of the shuttle, yeah, different directions for the, for the gravitational force. We get a little bit of a net squeeze down on the shuttle. And they can measure it. Uh, it's pretty small, but for something like uh, this moon and other moons, yeah, it's pretty significant. Here's another sketch. Uh, this is from a few semesters ago. Uh, Jupiter and Io. Now, here's the relative sizes of Jupiter and Io, but not their relative distances. So let me back Jupiter off a little bit. Okay. Now, this is a quarter of Jupiter down in the lower left. Okay. And... This little red blob up here is Io. Now, we haven't got anything else sketched in there. Okay, but see if you can make a sketch in roughly those proportions. Now, I'm going to pull away from this. Uh, or actually, I'm not going to pull away. I'm going to pull into Io. Okay, so here's a close-up on Io. All right. And again, on, on one way to think about this tidal deformation is that this... This little uh, white square on the front or the Jupiter side of Io, uh, it gets a bigger pull than this little white square on the far side of Io, the, um, op the side opposite Jupiter. And so you have a pair of f geomet uh, gravitational force arrows. The one on the back side is smaller. The one on the front side is bigger. And so again, you know, you, you can say that uh, you get a bigger pull force on the front. And you, I mean, if it was water, you know, like the earth, we, we can see this in the tides of the oceans of the earth. You know, it's very easy to see because water will just go. It'll flow. You know, it's not rigid at all. Right. But a planet, you know, will deform itself a little bit. And, Ju and Io is close enough to Jupiter that it gets significant. <coughs> Uh, squeeze down. So it's getting squeezed in several different directions. And here's the other thing with Io. It's getting squeezes from the other moons of Jupiter as well. Jupiter is a complex system. And the, the, the satellites of Jupiter have, here's a picture of some of them. Um, Callisto and Europa. Uh, here are the, the shadows. So this is, this is Callisto here and here's the shadow that it casts on uh, Jupiter. And here's Europa here. And here's the shadow that it casts right there. There's the shadow that Europa casts. Now, Io's up here. It's, uh, we don't see the shadow of Io. Uh, but they're all in gravitational interaction. And in fact, they've developed something that we call uh, gravitational Resonance. So make a note of that. Gravitational or orbital resonance. R-E-S-O-N-A-N-C-E. All right, now we're going to look at this um, in the context of tidal deformation and heating. Uh, and we're going to compare Jupiter and Earth, Io and our moon. Now, here's the orbit of Io around Jupiter, and it's 42, uh, 421,600 kilometers, and the moon's orbit around Earth is 384,400 kilometers, 240,000 miles, okay, so it's, um, you know, yeah, why not, because I'm going to give you a ratio here, all right, I'm not going to ask you to memorize. If I ask you a question, I should have started this recola. Um, uh, if I ask you a question about this on the test, you'll have this table okay. to think about. So I mean, you know, don't don't worry. Like, oh, I got to memorize 421,600. You know, but think about what it means because here's what it means: the size of the orbit to the planet. For Io, it's 6 to 1. For Earth, it's 60 to 1. Now, what that means is that if, if the moon was in a little bit closer orbit, 
it might have enough tidal interaction with Earth to still be volcanically active. And we know it has been volcanically active, but in the distant past. And so, um, and you can look, this is another reference to the planetary uh, fact sheet. Um, so the radio of the orbital, the orbital radius versus the planetary radius. So orbital radius divided by planetary radius. Okay, so for Io it's six to one. For Earth it's 60 to one. So the moon is out there. Now it's forming a, a significant tidal deformation of the oceans of the Earth. And we see that every day. But the interior of the Earth is not getting very much flex from the moon. And the moon is not getting much interior flex from Earth. But I don't, yeah, it's, in the, it's close enough to do that. Now here's, a, here's the bottom line. So this is where we have the uh, tidal heating. We don't have tidal heating for the moon. Not enough anyways to cause volcanoes to still be blazing. Uh, here's what I want to mention to you in the context uh, of this ratio, the size of the orbit and the size of the planet itself. Eventually, you'll be so close to the planet that the tidal forces are going to rip you completely apart. Let me repeat that. Eventually, or, or if your orbit is close enough, the tidal forces will rip the moon apart. This is something called the Roche limit, R-O-C-H-E. The Roche limit, and what it means is, for every, like the, the rings of Saturn, okay? Okay, if, if something goes inside the Roche limit, the tidal deformation, it depends on the size of the planet, depends on the size of the moon, their density and stuff, but, but basically for every planetary or moon system, there's a limit that if you go inside that, you're gonna tend to s disintegrate into smithereens and form a ring system. All right, now we think, that's, what's the theory on Saturn? Is those rings are young or old? Because I've heard, but people don't know how old the Saturn's rings are. If they're from the early solar system when, when Saturn just formed, or if just the last few uh, million years. Does anybody have a theory? Jenny's looking it up. She doesn't even know. But it, the uh, ring systems will form when a planet of some size, you know, big or small, gets inside the, the Roche limit, bang, it's going to get disintegrated. Okay, it'll put, and just like uh, Comet, go ahead and make a note of this, Comet Shoemaker-Levy that plowed into Jupiter about 20 years ago, 1990-something. Um, it was pulled apart. I mean, it was a comet, so it's this big nugget of uh, ice and a little bit of rock and dust. It glows when it's close to the sun, easy to see. It's a comet, so, you know, it's a nugget. Uh, but it got blown apart when it got too close to Jupiter. And so when it impacted Jupiter, it was bang, 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 a trail of impacts in the atmosphere of Jupiter, Shoemaker-Levy. Uh, and that's because it was pulled apart by tidal forces. It was too close to Jupiter. So the size, of it, it depends on the size of the planet, the size of the comet, the size of the moon, whatever it is. But if it gets closer uh, than that, in a certain distance, it's gonna get pulled apart. Okay, Jenny just told me that they think the you know because I read yes yeah, four point six billion years old is that from Wikipedia? No, it's from BBC. Oh, it's BBC. That's a little bit more reliable than Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, Wikipedia is all right for this kind of stuff. Uh, anyways, but not for much <laughs> much else. Uh, four point six billion years for the rings of Saturn, but I've heard. Other people say, well, actually, that they've got to be only about 100 million years. Yeah, so. Uh, but apparently, we'll go with Jenny's theory for now. All right now, if you have an object, I told you that the space shuttle, 
space shuttle is way inside the Roche limit for the moon. You know, the moon, you know, can get a little bit closer. Io can get a little bit closer to Jupiter before it starts to break apart. But the space shuttle is up there uh, 200 miles, way closer than the Roche limit for our moon, but not its Roche limit, all right? So if you have something small, like some of the small inner moons, here's a couple of them, Thebes and Amalthea. And so this is like a moon about the size of Long Island. If you've ever been up to New York and you've been out on Long Island, you know, I've never actually been on Long Island further than Brooklyn. So that doesn't really count as Long Island. But anyways, uh, these things are, you know, so about the size of a state, a small state in the United States. And we've talked about Enceladus, you know, that's about the size of Florida. But these guys are not going to be susceptible until they get really, really close. Right. So they could break apart. Now, the exception to that is if, if, if you're in the asteroid belt or something, you know, you can, you know, the asteroid belt's just this churning mass, you know, things basically jostling each other. And uh, so the asteroid belt, you can have collisions and stuff, but um, uh, that's basically outside of everybody's Roche limit. All right, let's talk about Enceladus again. And let's talk about it. You know, we know it's about a 500 kilometer diameter. And um, we know that it's not one of the larger ones as Jovian moons go. It's good size. But I want to reinforce uh, the Chicxulub impact, which we think, what was it now? Comet? Asteroid. Asteroid. Jenny just is shaking her head. Definitely asteroid. Okay. Um, so the crater's about 180 kilometers in diameter. Now, the, the normal rule of thumb is, um, you know, a ratio of 10 to 1 between the size of the crater and the size of the impactor. But it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just, so we think that the impactor at Chicxulub was about 10 kilometers. Uh, so it's a little bit bigger than, um, you know, than 100. But it's not like 1,000 kilometers in diameter. So. Um, so here's a picture, you know, the ring-shaped structure. And this is a, a density plot, you know, where they can plot the density of, of basically of rock uh, from space and, uh, you know, from measuring from satellites and stuff. Um, and this one, you can see the outline of the Yucatan Peninsula here. And half of the crater is on the peninsula, half of it's off the peninsula, out in the ocean, at the Gulf of Mexico, approximately. Okay, but you can kind of see it. Um, so for us, the question, you know, an interesting question is, if Enceladus, about 500 kilometers in size, impacted Earth, uh, what would it destroy? Because they think that this is the one that greased the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. All right. Uh, so if, if Enceladus was to impact Earth at Avon Park, Florida, anybody here from Avon Park? Or near Avon Park? It's kind of in the middle of Florida. I'm surprised. Oh, you know what I was going to ask you guys? Is anybody here from that, that school in, where, where is it, by Fort Lauderdale? Parkland. Parkland, Florida. Anybody here from that school? Yep. One, two. Oh, my goodness. Did you guys know any of those kids that were killed? The, the shooter was my neighbor. Oh, my I, I know I, I didn't know him personally, but. Wow. What about you? Didn't know anybody? Oh, God bless them. all those kids. I read last night that there was a girl and her dad was up at the White House yesterday, you know, you know, talking to the president and all the other people that were there. And his daughter was shot nine times. I can't even think about it. 
anyway, hopefully that'll never happen here at UCF. Uh, now, this is an imaginary disaster. Let's get back to astronomy. Um, if you had an impact there, 10 times the radius of Enceladus, that would basically create a crater uh, bigger than any crater we see on Earth. Um, you know, all the way down to Venezuela, all the way up to Canada, you know, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So basically, um, if, if something the size of Enceladus was to hit us, it would destroy uh, our entire population. It would be worse than Chicxulub. You know, it might totally destroy all life permanently on Earth. So that would be like a kill shot. So hopefully that will never happen. And if we ever saw something that size coming toward our planet, we don't have a hope of changing its course. You know, something the size of Long Island, you know, some of those other moons we were just looking at. You know, there's chunks of, of rock floating around the solar system, not many. You know, we, we're trying to spot them all, but there's plenty that we haven't spotted. And if something that big, you know, we don't have, we don't have much of a shot. You know, you know, blowing up Long Island, we don't... If you took all the bombs that the Russians have and all the bombs that the Americans have, and tried to blow up Long Island with it, it would, you know, it's, it wouldn't be possible. So we don't really, you know, we gotta, we gotta have, keep our eyes open. So here's a guy that's got his eyes open. What movie is this from? This is not Men in Black. This is, uh, maybe it is Men in Black. Anyways, Mimas is a Saturn, go ahead and make a note of this, a moon of Saturn. And Mimas is outside the rings of Saturn. But it has a significant orbital resonance with a particular range in the uh, rings of Saturn. This is Agent Simmons from, I think this is MIB3 or something like that. Oh, I know, he was in uh, Transformers, right? Something like that. So this, this gap here, this is called the Cassini division. Right here it is up here. And Mimas is a, is a, you know, it's a decent sized moon. It's not that big, but it's round. And it's way out, it's out there past the, the rings, not too far past. But the Cassini division is in orbital resonance with Mimas. So what that means is that every time the, the, the fragments in, inside the Cassini division, every time they orbit twice it can, and uh, Mimas orbits once. So they're all, there's always going to, I think that's what the ratio is, two to one or three to two or something like that. You can look it up. Do you know what it is? Mimas and the Cassini division. And anyways, there's an orbital resonance. So every couple, three laps around the Cassini division, it's going to get another tug from Mimas. Now, Mimas is outside the rings, okay? But it has effectively cleared most of the Cassini division. Now, it's not completely empty. So this is from the Cassini probe, all right? And Cassini is the Italian astronomer that first noticed this big gap. It's not really a gap. And there's all kinds of stuff in there. And so you can see it's, it's not completely clear. But Mimas is the one that we think is clearing it. All right, here's the, this is actually pointing at a little tiny moon in there. A very small one, you know, that we discovered recently. So what Mimas is doing in the Cassini division is very similar to how Jupiter clears the gaps in the asteroid belt. And we can see gaps in the asteroid belt as well. Right? Now the asteroid belt is orbiting the SUN. Right? And Jupiter is a satellite of the sun. It's orbiting the sun. So what Mimas is doing to these rings that orbit Saturn, Jupiter 
big Jupiter has done for the asteroid belt, okay? And what we're going to do uh, when we return to lecture Thursday next week, uh, we, were, we are going to talk about asteroids. And so um, let's dismiss. We're a little early today. It's fine. Study for exam two. Check your discussions. And I'll see you on Tuesday. Be here early. Be here on time.